So hello, this is um, this week's um, fourth day and today's talk, um, the first talk will be about minimal Lagrangian on toric manifolds and the speaker will be Rosa Sena Diaz. So you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, what I want to speak about today is uh, joint work with um, Gonzalo Oliveira. So let me write up his name. Okay, so um, there's really two sides to the story and uh, let me start with uh, the first one. So first of all, it, it, it involves minimal submanifolds, which is a, a, a really old subject in, in mathematics. So uh, let me write down the, the definition for you. So um, suppose you have uh, a Riemannian manifold. You need a metric to, to discuss these. Then a submanifold which I think of this way with its map is said to be minimal. If, uh, if it's a critical point, for the volume in the following sense. So, Suppose you have any variation of your submanifold, meaning just a family of submanifolds starting at your given one, then you want to have that this is zero. Okay, so um minimal in in this sense so these these have been studied for a long time they're very classical objects so they were uh, they were first defined by euler and lagrange who also found examples so they're around from the 1700s. And taking that into account, it's kind of surprising how, how elusive they are. So we actually have few examples. I mean, we have some, but we have few. And mainly, we don't really have that many techniques for constructing them. So let me. Uh, let me uh, say what, what we have. Well, first of all, okay, so I, I should start by saying that there are some examples which, which show that they are important. And in fact, okay, so geodesics are one-dimensional examples, and we all know how important geodesics are in Riemannian geometry. Okay, the, the other, uh, the other uh, example, the other ex example, which you're probably, which you, which you know, is, is complex submanifolds in uh, projective space, but more generally in, in, in care manifolds. And there's also another, which is important in, in, uh, um, in symplectic geometry, which is pseudo-holomorphic curves. So these are 2D examples. So pseudo-holomorphic curves. And, and of course, you need a symplectic manifold to have these examples. Okay, so so there there are so so minimal submanifolds sort of generalized notions that we know are important in geometry and so I, I guess it's 
totally justified that we should study them. And in fact, uh, it's known that they carry a lot of information. They carry a lot of geometric information. But as I was saying, we, we have a few uh, general constructions for them. So what do we have? In, in, in 3D, they, I mean, there's, there's, we can find them through minimizing volume and isotopy classes. So minimizers of volume in isotopy classes. This was uh, uh, exploited by Mix, exploited and introduced by Mix and Yao. Okay, we also have uh, another group of constructions, which is uh, gluing, meaning that if we have two minimal submanifolds, sometimes we know how to produce a, a third one from them. And this is the Capuleus, and lots of people have used this. And um, there's also min-max, which is due to uh, Koda Marx. So the min-max uh, method, which is due to Koda Marx gives potentially uh, examples. I mean, it's very general, but but this is this is sort of what what we have. So the 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 problem is that it it we have few examples in sort of the middle dimensions. We have geodesics and pseudo holomorphic curves. We have co-dimension one things, but we don't have that many examples in in middle dimension or around middle dimension. If that makes sense, because the dimension may not be. Okay, which brings me to, well, so, so my next topic is um, Lagrangians. Which seems completely unrelated. It, it's, uh, it's a topic in symplectic geometry and not in Riemannian geometry. So let, let me start with, with the definition. Suppose you have a symplectic manifold. Which means, I, I, I already alluded to this, but this means that um, it's, so this omega is a two form and it's non-degenerate and closed. Okay, so so suppose you have a, a symplectic manifold and it's it needs to be even dimension, so let's let's call it the dimension two n and take a half dimensional manifold or submanifold. Uh, well, this is Lagrangian. If the symplectic form restricts to zero on it, if the symplectic form is zero on it. OK, so, so these are kind of the opposites of minimal submanifolds in, 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 in the following sense. There, there are really very many. So let me give you an example. Suppose you have, uh, let's call it X. Suppose you have any manifold. It's cotangent bundle is always symplectic. Canonically, there is a canonical choice for a symplectic structure on it. It doesn't really matter to me what it is. What matters to me is that X embeds uh, 
as a submanifold in its cotangent bundle, just just in the zero section. So it's this. And the claim is that this is Lagrangian. Of course, I didn't tell you what the form, what the symplectic form was, so you didn't you can't check this claim. But but my point is that any submanifold can be seen as a Lagrangian somewhere. And there is a famous quote in in symplectic geometry due to Weinstein, which is everything. Is a Lagrangian, which refers to the example above, but also to the fact that many problems and many important problems in symplectic geometry translate into problems about Lagrangians. Okay, so so the problem with Lagrangians is not that we have few, is that we actually have too many. And so uh, symplectic geometers want to organize them, whatever that means. And and in fact, they are they are they play an important role. And why is that? Well, two two reasons. First, um, so they they are they are uh, the fundamental objects in in Fukaya categories. They are the objects. I shouldn't say fundamental. They are the objects in Fukaya categories. And Fukaya categories are sort of, uh, they, they give our best symplectic invariance. So they, they, they function as sources of symplectic invariance. Okay, and second reason why, why they're important is that they, they are, boundaries of pseudo-holomorphic curves. They give good boundaries. They give, they give good boundary conditions for pseudo-holomorphic curves. And so uh, pseudo-holomorphic curves are, are important in symplectic geometry. Okay, so uh, the question is, can we mix minimal so the question is, can we mix minimal and Lagrangian? So, so to, to speak about Lagrangian, we need symplectic. And to speak about minimal, we need, um, we need a, a Riemannian. So to have both, I guess we we need to be in the Kähler setting. Okay, and and uh, this this has been uh, thought of before. I mean, people have studied minimal Lagrangians, and. Uh, so let me let me say a little bit about minimal Lagrangian tori in particular and why why they are popular. So it just so happens that um, uh, a Strominger, Zaslow. And Yao predicted 
that uh, every six dimension Calabi-Yau uh, has a large set where, where it can be fibered by um, minimal Lagrangian tori. So submanifolds that are both minimal and Lagrangian, when, which are so also diffeomorphic to tori, not toric tori. So. Okay, and why, why do they care? Because they use this vibration to um, determine the mirror. So the mirror, which is this um, mythical entity. So the mirror of the 60, well, we don't know if it's mythical, right? Uh, of 60 Kalabi Yao uh, can or is, is obtained by compactifying uh the dual vibration which means take uh each of the torus in, in in their of each torus with the same vibration and then try to find a compactification okay so so because of this uh minimal lagrangian tori uh, became became coveted, so so they, they became important, and people started to look for them. Okay, so in, in the setting where where I've been talking, so in toric Kaler manifolds. So if you, if you remember, so uh, a toric Kähler manifold is uh, a Kähler manifold with the torus action, and there is a moment map for this torus action, which sends the manifold to some convex polytope. And so I, I've said and I've used before that if if you think of the pre-image of the interior of the moment polytope. It's actually an open dense set where the TN action is free. This vibration, the, the, this mu becomes a trivial vibration. So um, you can write uh, your, your open dense subset in the following way. So we do have a, a, a set where we have we have a large set where we have a vibration. And so I think it's natural to ask the question, are, and, 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 uh, and also the fibers are Torah. So are, are any of the fibers above the interior of P, minimal because it's uh, it's obvious that they are tori and in fact they are lagrangians because because it's um, it's a consequence of the action angle properties for these for the coordinates we get okay so so this is the 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 question i want to address any any questions? Uh, okay, so um, so now Okay, so I, I, I want to look for minimal submanifolds 
sitting inside toric manifolds. And toric manifolds have symmetry. So I, I would like to exploit that. And how, how, do, how does one uh, take advantage of, of, of symmetry in, in the context of, of minimal submanifolds? So how to exploit symmetry in, in, in the context of minimal this this is this this question is is uh is much more general than the toric setting whenever you have a group acting on a manifold does that help you find minimal submanifolds that's the question so how to exploit symmetry in the context of minimal submanifolds okay so You may have heard of this because it's a very it's a very general principle. I'm going to sort of try to state Pali's principle. It's called Pali's principle of um, uh, maximal or minimal criticality. But Pali's principle, I think, is, is how one speaks about it. Okay, so what does this say? Suppose you have a manifold, and suppose you have a Lie group. acting on your manifold. And uh, suppose you also have a function, a smooth function. Then what the principle says is that the, the critical points of the function, which are invariant under the group action, are actually the critical points of the function restricted to invariant elements in the manifold. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain this a little bit and I'll try to say why. why why it's important why it's useful okay so so that this mg means the set of uh, fixed points by the action and so suppose you have uh, a critical point which is also invariant, then this means that the derivative of f at that point is identically zero. So of course, uh, then the, the um, derivative at that point just along the invariant points is zero. Okay, this is asking, th this is asking less than that. What uh, the principle says is that, in fact, you're, you're, to check that a point is critical, you only need to check that the derivative vanishes along the directions that are invariant. So this is what the principle says. OK, so we 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 first of all um where would we why would we want to use this well we would want to use it in in a very generalized context we would like to use it when m is the set of submanifolds so of course this already shows you that this this will make problems because it's it's an infinite dimension manifold if it is one we want our our suppose we, suppose we have a G acting well, sub manifolds of M and suppose G acts on your manifold, then 
G also acts on the space of submanifolds. Okay, so what is the F? What is the function? Well, it's just well. And then so Pali's principle. If it were to hold, would say that, um, well, it would say that um, minimal submanifolds of M of, sorry, I'm not of M that are G invariant. Are just um, critical for or, or critical submanifolds for the uh, volume among G invariant variations of the submanifold. And there are less gene variant variations than variations. Okay, so the problem is that uh, Pali's principle doesn't always hold. And, and Pali himself Count counter examples. Okay, but the good news is that um, Xiang and Lawson show that in the setting where we want this, it works. So this is they they prove that. Uh, Pali's principle holds for the M and F and G that I wrote in the previous piece. So this is a, a theorem. They say that um, suppose you have a manifold and G acts on that manifold, then um, a submanifold is minimal. If and only if it is critical for volume, sorry. Among G invariant variations. Okay, any any questions on on Pali's principle or on Xiang Lawson's theorem? Okay, so um, so I, I am now in a position to sort of describe. Our, our results. So let me write down what, what we showed. Uh, okay, so, so suppose we have a toric manifold. endowed with a toric kilometric. Um, and suppose we, we call its moment map mu, it always exists. Then we prove the following. Um, 
So there's at least one fiber of mu, which is minimal. So at least one of the fibers of mu is minimal. Uh, okay, also if uh, Ricci is positive, then there is a single minimal fiber. And a third thing, um, so given given any set, oops, given any discrete set of points in uh, in the moment polytope, so you can you can imagine that it's finite. Um, there is a toric Kähler metric. Uh, so given any discrete set of points, okay, what, what, I, what I was saying was that uh, given any discrete set of points, there is uh, a metric uh, such that the fibers uh, above that set are minimal. So, uh, you know, it's definitely not true that all Kähler uh, toric metrics have a single fiber, which is minimal. You can actually prescribe which fibers are minimal. But at least one is minimal. And if the Ricci is positive, then yes, a single one is minimal. Okay, so this is this is what what we showed. So it's actually a, a constructive uh, result. So I, I, I want to show you how it works. But first, let me let me talk a little about the context, and 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 then I'll give an example before. Okay, so okay, so in two thousand and one, Goldstein had uh, shown that um, every Kähler Einstein toric manifold. Uh, 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 admits a single minimal Lagrangian fiber. And of course, uh, this is a special case of, of our result. So this is a special case of our result because uh Kähler Einstein implies positive Ricci and in, 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 in fact implies positive constant Ricci. Okay, and then there was an improvement of this result by Pacini. So Pacini generalized um, generalized Goldstein. for non-abelian actions. So he has pretty general results uh, showing about, uh, sh showing um, existence and uniqueness theorems about uh, uh, manifolds with uh, some non-abelian action. And he, he also proves things about the mean curvature flow on these uh, 
mean curvature flow on these on these manifolds. Okay, so before before I say more general things, let me give you an example. So let's let's think of CP two. So if you if you remember my my previous lectures for me, CP two is this. And um, a fiber above one of the interior points is a torus. So I can draw like this. And so if you if you remember, uh, toric Kähler metrics are given by symplectic potentials. But let's think of a specific toric killer metric. Let's think of the Fubini study metric. Then its symplectic potential is this. Okay, we actually we actually know of a minimal it, it has it has positive uh, Ricci because it's Keller Einstein. So it must have uh, a minimal, a unique in fact. Minimal Lagrangian fiber. And the question is, what is it? Okay, and there's actually uh, this is this is known. It's uh, it, it's known for uh, for um, reasons of symplectic geometry. It's it's the Clifford torus, and it occurs at x one and x two equals to one third. And I want to explain why by the end of the talk. Okay, but I, I need to say a few more things. So, so the one that works is here, is the one sitting above here. Okay, and any questions? Okay, so I want to say something about the proof of the theorem because the proof of the theorem is, is constructive and it will show me exactly how to calculate the, the minimal Lagrangian, for, for example, for CP2 with the Fubini study metric and, and, and we'll see that together. But let me first say something about the proof. Okay, so so this is where uh, the toric geometry comes in. So you have again the toric manifold, and again we will we will need this uh, large open dense subset, which is the pre-image. So this is a moment map. I'm calling it mu, which is the pre-image of this. And I get coordinates x theta because of this identification, which are called action angle. And what's good about them is, I, I think I've said this once before, but there's no reason why. So why, why this should be true unless unless we proved it and, and I didn't, but these are double coordinates for the the symplectic form. So in particular, if you have a p on the polytope and you want to think of its pre-image, so, so let's say, then 
uh, x is constant there. And so dx is zero. And the formula and the form is zero. So it's also half dimensional. So mu minus one p is always a Lagrangian. This has nothing to do with minimality. All fibers are Lagrangian. Okay, but now we, we would like to uh, use Sian Lawson's theorem. And so um, minimal is critical for, uh, sorry, I'm ahead of myself, for volume among Tn, so minimal plus Tn invariant. is critical for volume among Tn invariant variations. Okay, so here's what I should do. Oh, I can't create any more frames. I think for some reason I, let me go back to one. I don't know why it will end. Okay, so um, suppose you have a toric manifold as such, and uh, you have one fiber towards the torus above a point. Okay, what are the uh, variations that are T invariant? My claim is that, okay, so, so suppose you have. Um, this, then my claim is that if phi t is uh, Tn invariant, then its image is also a mu fiber. And why is that? Well, uh, so phi t of Tn will, will have some image to the moment map. So pick some point in that image. Because, uh, because it is, because phi t is Tn invariant, then well, the um, okay. So, because phi t is is t n invariant, then uh, the fiber above p t is contained in here. But uh, this has the fiber has half dimension, and this also has half dimension. So they must coincide. So for dimension reasons, they must coincide. So phi t of Tn are mu fibers, that is, Tn invariant variations are nearby fibers. So to calculate uh, volume variation, we need to calculate volume variation among fibers. Okay, and how does this work? Well, again, again, I need a piece of toric geometry. If you remember, every toric Kähler metric has a symplectic potential. I've already said this, but I'm going to need what the symplectic potential does. 
So what does it do? It, it gives an expression for the metric. So the symplectic potential comes from this formula. Okay, so when you when you, you you want the volume of a fiber, remember. So what is G restricted to a fiber? Well, on a fiber, X is constant. That's precisely what 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 it defines. So G restricted to a fiber is just sorry, is just this part because this vanishes. Okay, and the theta i, theta j are the angle coordinates on that fiber. It's a torus, so it has angle coordinates. So the volume of the fiber is just the volume of this metric. So it's the determinant of the Hessian, of the inverse of the Hessian. I guess I, 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 I said this before, but maybe you don't remember. Uij and Uij upper mean the Hessian of the symplectic potential and the inverse of the Hessian. Okay, so the volume of the fiber is this, and uh, well, when 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 p tends to the boundary of the polytope, the fibers collapse, so they tend to circles on the interior of facets, and then they collapse to point at at vertices. So their volume. Ten to zero. Okay, so so really, uh, minimal fibers are are critical points for uh, this determinant determinant Hessian minus one, which which is bounded below by zero. So it, it has a maximum on the interior. And that's your minimal fiber. Okay, so this proves the first part of our theorem. And it also, I think, kind of shows why sometimes there's more than a minimal fiber. It's just, uh, there's a minimal fiber for each critical point of the determinant of the Hessian inverse. And there's no reason why there should all only be a critical point of the minimal inverse. So in fact, let me, let me prove three for you. How does we? How, how does one prove that you can prescribe uh, minimal fibers? Well, so we prescribe minimal fibers by by prescribing critical points of of this function and. Uh, well, how how does that work? So so you need pick pick a function f say with uh, critical points at the prescribed set. So the question is, does there exist u a symplectic potential such that uh, the determinant of the Hessian Is is uh, well uh, is f or and the 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 problem is that symplectic potentials also need to satisfy a couple or three conditions, so such that this. And because it's a symplectic potential, it needs to be convex. It needs to satisfy, so this was what I was calling wrong. It needs to satisfy, it doesn't, 
the details don't really matter, but if you remember, this was what the second condition is. This, this is there's a boundary behavior for you. And then there was something extra, which I never explicitly said. Okay, okay, so I'm asking, is there a function u satisfying this and one, two, three? And now this equation here, I, I mean, you may have seen it before. This is a real motion pair equation, but it's a, it's a singular real motion pair equation on, on the boundary because u is, singular, is not smooth at the boundary. But in fact, it follows from some results of Caffarelli, Nuremberg, and Sprock that such u exists. This is, these are very interesting results, in fact. Uh, okay, so let me now go back to. the example, I've kind of shown you how to calculate uh, critical uh, uh, minimal fibers. So here is your U. Uh, we need to calculate the Hessian, its inverse, and then the determinant. In fact, we don't need to calculate the inverse, we just need to calculate whatever the determinant. Okay, so the Hessian, we had kind of calculated Hessians like this before. What it is, is this. It's very easy for calculation. Okay, what is the determinant of this? Again, you, you, you'd, need, you'd need to do the calculation, but I've done it. So here's what it is. So what we need is uh, we need critical points for this function. that sit inside this triangle. And well, there's, there's, there's the vertices, there's zero, zero, but inside or in the interior of the triangle, just one third, one third, which is the Clifford torus. So you see the Clifford torus from our point of view is really very simple. You just need to calculate the derivatives of this with respect to x1 and x2 and equals to zero. Any questions? Uh, okay, so let me just finish with um, a, a sort of a quick discussion on Hamiltonian deformations. So, so this is uh, important for uh, symplectic geometries. So um, so uh, uh, a deformation is, okay, well, let, let me, suppose you have um, a Riemannian manifold. and a submanifold in it. And you consider variations of phi. That is, it's a family of submanifolds starting at the given submanifold. Then phi t is said to be a Hamiltonian. Well, in fact, this is, sorry, this is a, a Riemannian. 
definition. So uh, phi t is said to be Hamiltonian if um, xt wedge omega is exact, where this xt is the vector field induced by the variation. So xt is a vector field on each submanifold, and it's just given this way. Well, you can pull it back soon. Okay, and Hamiltonian means this. And the definition that's important in symplectic geometry is uh, Hamiltonian stationary. So now you need um, I'm sorry, I should have said symplectic here. Then um, a submanifold is said to be Hamiltonian stationary. If 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 it is critical for volume among Hamiltonian variations. So instead of asking for your submanifold to be critical for all variations, which would mean that it's minimal, you just ask it to be critical for uh, volume among Hamiltonian variations, the, the ones defined above. So those are the ones who take into account the symplectic form. Okay, and uh, there are many questions concerning uh, Hamiltonian stationary uh, submanifolds. We, we, we don't really know much about them. But um, with Gonzalo, we showed that ontoric manifolds Let's let's call with with moment map mu um, then all, all mu fibers are Hamiltonian stationary. So there are a lot more Hamiltonian stationary fibers than minimal fibers, because all fibers are Hamiltonian stationary. OK, and this, this, uh, this let me just say that this generalizes uh, a result, which is due to uh, Le Gendre, Evelyn Le Gendre, and Jan Hoya, who, who proved We prove the above for um, the Gilliman metric. Okay, so we 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 know that um, uh, that the Clifford torus, for instance, minimizes volume among uh, Hamiltonian deformations, and this was this was proved uh, using. Uh, Floor homology, it's, it's a, a difficult result. And so we, we wonder whether uh, maybe our methods could, could give a different proof. It, it would mean understanding if there are other Hamiltonian deformations that, 
that are not fibrous. Uh, okay. Okay, I guess that's that's all I wanted to say. Are there questions? I guess if there aren't any questions, I'd like to thank you very much for thank these you. four lectures that were really insightful.